I'm open to people's interpretations. I mean, it's like, for instance, the name Death in June. Uh, there have been so many different interpretations, but I still think the most interesting one, which is one of the more recent in, in the past few years, was the fact that it was derived from the assassination of the Archduke Prince Ferdinand in Sarajevo in June 1914. And I'd never thought about that, but of course it does have a relevance, yeah. We live in a world shaped by what happened that day, yeah. Come by sometimes, and uh, our brutality, I think, comes from our emotion. It is never mechanized or systematized like Nazis have tried to. And uh, I think the brutality might come from our feminist aspects, and the elements come from our nervous side. In your shroud of regret, where war of ideas are full of guitar made in Russia um, so it was cheap at, at a place called Petticoat Lane in the east end of London it's a big market that used to take place on a Sunday but what I don't remember him ever buying me was an instruction manual about how and what to play and and things like you actually have to tune this thing up so I just used to play along in one or two strings I don't think my techniques change much you know, I'm still a very limited guitarist that somehow made a little go a long way but that, I, I got one of those very early, and I remember, I think, uh, doing a Pete Townsend when I was going to getting a bit older and just going out into the garden being so frustrated with it and smashing it to bits. <laughs> <laughs> but it did help in the long run. Uh, I eventually bought a proper guitar when I was 16 from, um, from ABC Music in Adelstone, and it was the brother of one of the members of Manfred Mann, whoever was playing in Manfred Mann at the time, and he was working in there, and he was quite helpful, and he cho chose a nice acoustic guitar and gave me a, you know, some hints on what to buy in terms of helping to learn. My first music lessons were at night school with nuns. It wasn't really working out for me. <laughs> but I was then put in the right, right direction, so, you know. Okay, this is the first song I ever wrote as an 18 year old in 1974. It didn't make sense then and it made even less sense when punk rock came along and I was in crisis, but in 1986 it did all come together and uh, this is it.
I'd met Tony Wakeford a year or two before punk rock, probably in about 75, and we'd actually met on demonstrations at like anti-Nazi league or rock against race, and rock against racism didn't exist then. It was sort of anti-demonstrations, because there was, uh, you know, London, England was a, a hotbed of extreme political views at the time. Uh, that's all I'm going to say there. So uh, people were looking at different options, right and left, and um, we got on. And I knew he was playing bass guitar in a group called Backwater, which did sort of pub rock cover versions of groups, songs, such as Status Quo, in fact. Um, and we'd met once or twice and things, and it seemed okay. And then one day I got a phone call from him in, it would be 76, and he said, have you heard of punk rock? And I said, yes, I have. Do you want to form a group? Yeah, okay. Because uh, he knew I had a, you know, was mucking around on the guitar. So we got together, and we got together with another person, which, which never really got out of the bedroom, but it, it, was, it was named ASU, which stood for Active Service Unit, which the IRA were calling their cells in London at the time, letting off bombs. And um, for me, it was kind of relevant, because a few years before, in 1974, I'd been blown up by the IRA in London, and I was very lucky. I just walked past a, a shop door and whack, it went off. And um, I never was hurt in one way. I just forced along Oxford Street totally upright but all in slow motion and quite you know filmic in a way and once I've been shoved along god knows how many yards I just, you know you turn around everything's in slow motion and uh, the brain's trying to cope with the situation and I remember these pigeons either stunned or dead just falling down out of the sky or from the windowsills in slow motion this it was it was a lovely moment in a way. I no one got killed that day, but people were getting killed quite regularly at the time, and uh, so it seemed appropriate. But nothing was happening, and then uh, I, I went down to the West Country to a seaside resort called Minehead uh, for a long weekend, probably in the spring of '77, and uh, punk by then was really beginning to make headlines and. Uh, I picked up a newspaper, I was drinking my favourite beer, still is my favourite beer, Carlsberg Special Brew. And uh, the newspaper headlines everywhere was crisis this, crisis that, crisis everywhere. Health service, ambulance service, Northern Ireland, blah, blah, blah. So that was the name. So I phoned up Tony, I said, we've got a name. And as soon as we had that name, things started happening. Uh, we got out of the bed bedroom, really. The guitarist we were working with was dropped people started to cross our paths. The lead singer came our way. He knew what became the lead guitarist. The lead guitarist knew what became the drummer. And we had a group. And then we performed our first show in um, mid-77 perhaps, I'm not quite sure, but it was at a punk festival in Guildford, which was just outside of London, which we considered probably our main town. And we immediately had success. We were, there were, we were lucky that in the audience there were reporters for Slash magazine from America, which you may or may not be aware of, but there was like Search and Destroy and Slash were the sort of main punky new wave fanzines or whatever you like to call it, more like newspapers uh, in the States. And um, they were impressed, interviewed us, and things started happening and said, well, you know, you should come over to America because, you know, the Americans would love you. And by then, you know, we started getting more regular performances in London. And in December 77, I did fly to America for a month and uh, things started to fall in place a bit more with interviews with other pe papers, such as Search and Destroy and um, meeting other groups in the LA punk scene, like the Dills, the Weirdos, Dickies, etc. and so on. Or you know the flesh eaters. You know, I remember seeing their first ever show at the the mask in in Hollywood. During the Black Plague in England, there were various areas of London put aside to bury the thousands of dead. And one of those areas was Blackheath, and uh, still today you're not allowed to build on it, and even the underground, the tube has to go around it. They're not sure what they might disturb and cause uh, to hit London again. But perhaps we need a bit more 
population decimation. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this is one of those songs that's dedicated to some pigs that used to live there. And, and uh, so when we did meet up, we were definitely slightly different to what we had been in crisis, which was what we wanted. Uh, so, so this would be late, mid 1980, yeah, late 1980. And we started trying out songs together. I'd been, I'd written a few things, and Tony obviously, obviously had. Um, we were trying things out with other people like a saxophonist or a man who operated drum machines and it wasn't really gelling at all, we knew that. Uh, and and uh, after some weeks of this, or it might have been even months, it seemed to go on and on and it was getting interesting but we knew it wasn't quite right. By then Tony had started working with another group called The Runners from 84 who were a, a punk group but had been sort of changing and they'd been in the audience of crisis and I'd, I'd met or at least knew one of them, Patrick Legas, the drummer. He'd been at one of the last crisis shows and he'd made an indelible impression with me because he'd had a dead seagull pinned to the back of his leather jacket in a sort of crucifix form and I thought well that guy's interesting <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he uh, via Tony would then came to see if he could play drums with Death in June so we set up a rehearsal and I remember him arriving and uh, he was driving a motorcycle at the time that he'd completely covered in fake leopard skin including his helmet so this guy turns up who looks like an SS stormtrooper getting off his bike it's like the bike's completely covered in leopard skin so is he and I thought oh Patrick's still sartorially challenged anyway and uh, came into these rehearsal studios which were called Cold Storage which was in Brixton which was run by a group called This Heat uh, who hadn't bothered showing us where any of the power points were and we spent half the evening looking where, around to where we were going to plug in our amps and eventually we did and it was almost instantaneous I think it was the first track we did was Heaven Street or the first song we started playing and Patrick just changed everything we knew it, we had a group. So um, that was the beginning of Death in June, although we didn't have a name for 
for the group at that time. The name actually came when some weeks or months later it was getting close to our first performance in November 81 with the birthday party in a Berlin-based group called Malaria. And uh, we thought, well, for that first performance we should actually have a record out. And um, we were recording the 12-inch Heaven Street 3-track and uh, I misheard something that Patrick said in the recording studio and, and I thought he'd said Death in June, but he didn't. But I said the name and it was instantaneous again. It was like, you know, manna from heaven. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've got a name. And uh, so we, we finally had the name which everyone has a great time interpreting, but even us, with this purely post-rationalization, it was just my hearing. And things began to fall into place, we began to play more performances, and we started to build a following. And at some of these early performances, we noticed that uh, members of Topi or PTV were turning up. And I was curious, because I was aware of PTV, I, was, I, like, I liked Genesis, and I liked what he was doing, and I was aware of David Tibet and his solo works with 23 Skidoo, and uh, his involvement with, with PTV, and, and of course I was aware of the sort of, the boys in, uh, that were now in Cole that were, you know, like Sleazy had been in Throbbing Gristle, TG. And so I was curious these people were coming to see us, and I was making notes about this. I was actually keeping a file on David Tibet, uh, eventually, at a show we did at the bottom of the post office tower in a club that was called The Living Room, which was run by Alan McGee, who was running Creation Records at the time, but was absolutely minuscule. He'd only put a few singles out by terrible groups and had his own fanzine, was still working with, for British Rowell, as far as I remember. And I knew Alan McGee from buying some of this stuff at Rough Trade. Uh, he introduced me to David Tibet, and uh, and uh, we got on immediately that evening. Death in June was doing sort of two different shows at this club, different approaches for each show, and I'd been thinking about working with someone else because Tony and uh, I thought my re working relationship with Tony Wakeford was coming to an end. I had a feeling, instincts were telling me. And this would be round about 1983. And uh, so as we got on like a house on fire, literally, it was uh, said, you know, we'd been noticing them turning up and he said, you know, he'd like Crisis. It was his, like one of his favorite outs, uh, punk groups and uh, he was intrigued in what Crisis had become basically, or at least the main songwriters, Tony and I had become in Death in June. and. Um, uh, so we started communicating, Tibet and I, and um, on, he gave a whole list of sort of typed out lyrics, some of which we started sort of culling words from. The first one, I think, was The Torture Garden, which was really Patrick choosing randomly some words from what he'd been given. And then for me was, she said, Destroy, uh, which was pretty much word for word on Christmas Day 1983 became the song. I'd, I'd, I'd set aside that day. Um, I, my, I, I told my partner I wouldn't be going to dinner with him and his family that day. Uh, I would stay in and write this song. I had a feeling that it's going to be important. And so I wrote She Said Destroy on Christmas Day 1983. And via that connection with Tibet, Tibet was sort of like the clearinghouse of post-industrial folk. He knew everyone. And so I started to meet people. Lost the will, the journey to foreign blood, the glimmer of the past, power of misery.
I will not hide My love will song My comrade in tragedy This is the best particular recording session of Happy Birthday Pigface Christus, which was going to be a current 93 12 inch. We went, I went along to do some work on that at Chalk Farm Studios in North London. And that day, uh, Jeff Rushton was there, or John Balance, whatever you want to call him. Uh, B, B was there from Into a Circle, Rose McDowell was there, Steve Stapleton was there of course Tibet and um, the guy that went on to become what's his name Bomb the Bass he was there too he was he'd come along from school he was still at school at the time and he knew B I can't remember his re re real name right now and so it's full of all these interesting people and we seem to all get on very well and that's where that led from it is literally a, a crossroads where we all seem to meet and started well we realized that we had then at least a lot in common and a sort of common feeling that we started working with each other um, it was via Tibet mm. Tim Simonon that's it, Tim, Tim Simonon, yeah. Yeah. yeah this this next song uh, I, I last heard on British radio, the BBC, in fact at 2.30 in the afternoon on a Saturday in 1987 I was out on the roof of the apartment I was living in at the time near Heathrow Airport, fixing some window uh, problem I had and this came out the kitchen window of a neighbour and I wonder what it was, it sounded different, but it sounded good, now I realise it was me, and this is it I think uh, 
so a source of symbolism, or at least contradictory, apparently contradictory symbolism, started hitting me quite, quite early. And then once you started using them, you began to fine tune your approach to the use of anything. And then you start seeing it everywhere, like I do constantly now. Boyd and I have talked about this. Uh, and in fact, that was Boyd was one of the people I left out. That um, it was via Tibet. Once again, I was introduced to it as a telephone call. Uh, that uh, I was a great admirer of Boyd's work beforehand, uh, and uh, I, I was really loving the way he presented himself with uh, the embossed black album. I think it was uh, Stum Three. I think was the catalogue number with just non written on it, and I loved that. And that inspired the actual the embossed writing for Death in June on the twelve inch. So it was that symbolic use there, but the, the way you use the end backwards so it looked like a wolf's hook and stuff like that. And that, that got me thinking, and it was via a phone call to Tibet one day when I was living with Tibet in 1986. Uh, and it was about his contribution to what was to become the Swastika Zunodi album that I first talked to, to, to Boyd Rice and, and um, was introduced then by that. And we've discussed this whole thing. I mean, it goes, it goes haywire when we're together. It's, it's good at the best of times, but when Boyd and I are together, symbolism just gets goes out the window. We can't order anything without getting six pounds sixty six come up on a on till or thirteen pounds or or we see things. The first car we'll see almost without um, yeah without doubt will be a car registration number with six 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 on it. It's almost like it's okay, boys. We're looking after you, and you're like pat, a little pat on the head. It resolved, and it becomes almost a joke. But you know, it's, it even has a scene in the Pearls Before Swine film. But it's true. I mean, you know, it is true all the time. So symbols are all around you. If you get fine-tuned into these things, you keep seeing them and reading however, whatever you want into them. Uh, and so people will read whatever they want into the symbols I use. Um, but I certainly am. I'm not consciously on the lookout for it. They just come straight in, straight at you. I mean, I've already had it happen yesterday, the first day I was in Boston. I saw the sign, hopefully it was a good sign, at least I survived yesterday anyway. We'll see what happens today. <laughs> but it's, um, so you get to, to, to use your skills at sort of um, creating them yourself and seeing how they can be interpreted. Contrary to popular belief, this wasn't written about Berlin, it was written about Sydney in 2000 and some piggy friends of mine. <laughs> I feel that they deserve it, I will wrap them around my little finger. Why not? I'm, I'm still here after so many years. I can afford to play with people. <laughs> and if they're stupid enough to play along, you know? Um, 
but it really depends. Most people are fine, and uh, and I'll give answers accordingly, interesting or not. You know. But, mm. During my stay in Sydney in 1989, I had experienced one of the most terrible and terrifying electrical storms I've ever experienced and witnessed. And I wandered down to the harbour, and as the thunder strikes echo between the skyscrapers, thoughts of my own personal loss, decimation, and Yukio Mishima came to mind, and this is what came out. Genet's work on me because it was 20 years ago this month I was reading Funeral Rites, the first book I ever read of his, in the back of a van touring in Italy, which was which turned out to be the last tour that Patrick Legas and I did together promoting Nada. And in a couple of weeks we'll be doing a, an anniversary show in London. Hopefully that all goes well, although I had a terrible nightmare about it last night. But so Jean Genet definitely was inspirational and the work of Yukio Mishima and the odd thing about that is even on my mind now it was because a few days ago in San Francisco I met someone in a gay bar there a Japanese guy who started talking to me and he was in this country doing some promotional DVD on health and fitness and it turned out he knew Yukio Mishima and he used to exchange letters with him and he was very very surprised that he'd met someone like myself who could talk to him about the books he liked and my respective favourite favourites. So so it's uh, a lot of odd things keep happening as regards my history at present to me personally. 
Um, outside of that, there's been so many things. Joe, Joe Meek, for instance, that's sort of England's answer to Phil Spector. The first record that was ever bought for me was by my father, buying uh, the Tornadoes Telstar. And um, I think that was such a strange record. And he, or, I mean, Joe Meek was a totally interesting individual as well, and that had an influence upon me, I suppose, or, or I found inspiration or those kind of odd sounds that I thought I could use and somewhere along the lines I suppose I'd use my own fair assortment of odd sounds. Um, as I said earlier, growing up in England in the early, you know, late 50s, early 60s, it was of course I must have been just soaking it up all the time. There was bits and pieces going on that left an indelible impression somewhere along the line. Um, listening to the Love album and uh, Forever Changes and the Love and Terracot album by Charles Manson years ago, I think that was courtesy of, at least Love was courtesy of David Tibet and realising that you could use beautiful melodies but with contradictory lyrics. So you can sing lovely things about the snot caking against your pants and uh, you know, etc and so on. And uh, they're, they're the sort of moments that stand out in my mind, but it could be so many things. Seeing Lenny Riefenstahl films, for instance, for the first time, Triumph of the Will, or news documentaries. I mean, it was, you know, it was also the Vietnam War was a huge thing on me, growing up to that, every day seeing that on television, and then, then meeting someone in 1980 who'd been there from the very beginning, from 64 to 74, and I still know he's my best friend in Australia, who's an Australian who was in Vietnam, and what he had to say about certain situations, uh, and how much he missed Vietnam. He loved it. He said it was the grooviest time of his life. People being honest about their experiences in those things. Um, and meeting other people, meeting other people that were at the end in Berlin. I've just recently seen the downfall of the Untergang, well, I know someone personally who was there, who, whose last battles were in the tear garden, the Villa Goebbels and the Führer bunker. And he survived, he was a private that managed to get away when they were given the, you know, the orders to every man for himself, you've got to go now. He did survive and he lives very close to me where I live in Australia. Um, they're sort of fundamental moments. He sort of helped keep me going. When I met him in 1989, when I was really I had undergone a spiritual death in the UK, and I didn't think there was any future, he was part of my resurrection. So there, there's too many different things. I mean, it's hard to say. <laughs> la 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 la.
Have you found that you've had to um, sort of change the way you do business over the years? I trust fewer people. Mm -hmm. And I can read when there's going to be problems, and I know how people are going to react. It's made me a lot more cynical. Um, yeah, unfortunately. whatsoever I think everything's been brilliant I think it's all gone according to plan I mean I've got frustrated at some stages about certain things but then you, know, you think no that was meant to happen it was meant to happen at that time um, to force an issue to have made it happen sooner it probably wouldn't have worked out as well um, one of the best films I've seen recently and there's been sh certainly a, a lack of any films that have had any impression for me was um, God, I'm trying to think of the name. It's gone straight out of my mind. The butterfly effect, and it. And I thought, no, that's true. If you do change things, it can all go not according to plan. So, I think it's worked out. I've been constantly given signs that it is the right path. So I don't have any regrets whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Quick, get a drink and get pissed listening to this. Come on now, hurry up and get the bar.
I'm doing the job I've always dreamed to, of doing. I did do exactly what I wanted to do in life. I've seen the world. I've, I've had a very interesting life. You know, done lots of interesting things. Met lots of interesting, lovely people. You know. Is there still stuff left to do? Is there, you know? I would like to think so, but sometimes I have had thoughts recently. I think no, I have done everything. I just would like to spend more time with the people I love. And I really love the people I love. So. Any uh, any misconceptions about you that you want to you want to clear up? No. <laughs> you like people talking about you? Do you think that's my ears burn constantly? <laughs> I lie awake at night, two o'clock in the morning, and I can set, tell my partner something's going on out there, somewhere in the rest of the world, where it's like midday, something is going on, and sure enough, I find out a few days later. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, it's like, you know, if it wastes people's time that I don't like, that's good. But if it enriches people's lives that, or people that like me or I like, that's good too. You know, it's all part and parcel of the process. Do you think there's no such thing as bad publicity? Do you think publicity is something that... I wouldn't go that far. I think there, are, there is publicity that can actually just ruin things. But it depends on how you handle it. Mm. So far, so good. <laughs>